don't you just love when your favorite teams get revenge in beautiful fashion? This is The Rich Report bringing you the richest content across entertainment. Welcome back to the channel. Thanks for watching if you are following us on YouTube and thanks for listening if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Welcome to episode 14. Gentlemen, we got to get right into it. Well, first off, let's just introduce them. David Church and Johnny Crane joining as always. Gentlemen, how are you doing this Wednesday afternoon? I'm doing good. Uh, Last night was an interesting night in the world of baseball, but I think the biggest thing that got looked over was our man, our five man, uh, our fifth man in the rotation, Merrill Kelly, took a no hitter into this like seventh inning. So that's a little bit appreciative, but that got overlooked because of Joe Kelly's inability to command his pitches. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, but good, good fun action last night. And as much as we can get in this, you know, social distance season in MLB, we still got a bench clearing little altercation, little, 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 little fisticuffs, not, not too much, but it was a good time. Hey, at least y'all got action. My team lost to COVID all their, their games. They got moved back. So yeah, we, we play the Yankees tonight, so that'll be great. They're going up against Garrett Cole. We'll see how that goes, but yeah, we got some action. All right, let's talk about it. Not only are they going to lose so much to every team they face, but they also lost to COVID. Oh, the Orioles can't win. They literally can't. It's hilarious. Thanks, Miami. Well, the Joe Kelly redemption season has gone off to a pretty great start as, you know, as as everyone saw the meme of Joe Kelly's face as he's walking off, giving the little after to Carlos Correa. And I mean, we could have, we all expected this to happen. The Dodgers needed their revenge, not just by winning, but they were going to show their displeasure to the Astros. It's going to happen at some point. And who better than Carlos Correa, who was like, oh, well, you don't know the facts, so shut the F up. And then during the game, already has a home run, hit an RBI single uh, after that. And so you get Joe Kelly, and what was it, the sixth? I believe it was the bomb of the sixth. And first, Alex Bregman, it's a 3-0 count, and then Joe Kelly decides, hey, let's throw behind him. Now everybody thinks, oh, well, it was a uh, command issue. He had no command of his fastball, but come on. It's it's a 3-0 count. He's throwing behind him. I think that that one was intentional. And then he goes and fires one at Correa, misses him again. But at the end of the day, he got the win as he struck him out. And then you also have the the apparent quote that he had in the nice swing, you female dog, after. <laughs> after. And so, yeah. And there you have it. The bench is cleared, but MLB says, no, no, we don't like that. And so now they are looking into possibly suspending Joe Kelly for inciting a potential brawl and bench is clearing because, oh, social distancing. Whatever they're more they're worried about social distancing, but when guys literally cheated the game, it was okay. It was just oh, move on, get over it, gentlemen. Is this is this the is this the peak of the revenge the Dodgers will get on the Astros, or will it continue to escalate tonight? I I think it. It, it's it's a gray area right now at this point because at, on one end you want to see some retribution for a, or just some some something to happen against the Astros because of what they did in 2017 with the cheating scandal. It really just kind of because because we did not get we did not get the ending we wanted from the commissioner's investigation when it came to trying to figure out what the Astros actually did. We did not get what we wanted. A lot of people wanted them to be, you know, stripped of the titles. And then they, a lot of the people wanted, you know, to, for them to not even be uh, playoff contention at the, uh, for this season. And it's a great, it, if that's going to be the case, then players themselves are going to take it upon themselves to police themselves. They're going to take it because that's, it's been a part of the game for since its inception uh so and it that doesn't mean that it's right sometimes it doesn't mean that it's right you know i i understand the complete you know being against throwing you know 95 to 96 mile an hour pitches at someone's head yeah that's seriously dangerous that's that's the game right there that's the game you play but at the same time if they would have came out if the this is going back to when the cheating scandal broke if the astros would have came out and said 
yes, we did this. We apologize. We are sorry. Then I think this would have been differently. But when they try to defend themselves and said, we did not do this. Absolutely not. We are not like that. We earned that championship trophy. Then that's to the point where you're going to say, oh, okay, well, they don't care. We're going to take it into our own hands. And that's what Joe Kelly did. Joe Kelly took it into his own hands. Now, granted, um, he has troubles with command. I mean, it's obvious now at this point because, you know, he can't locate a fastball anymore and he certainly can't locate a pitch when he's throwing in his backyard because every time he gets near a glass window, it, it, it cries and gets scared. So th- I don't necessarily know if he was exactly trying to hit them, but it, there was definitely afterwards some serious back and forth talk. So, I mean, it's, it's fun to it, – it's, I mean – I don't know. It's just, it's such a gray area at this point that, I mean, we're going to see more of it. And I don't know if I necessarily want to see more of it. I just don't want to see the Astros win at this point. I don't want to see them win. If I know anything about sports, it's two things. Now, Cameron, I know we've talked about it before. NASCAR fans don't forget incidents between drivers. It might take years for a driver to get back at another driver, but they remember. Baseball players and baseball teams, it is 10 times worse. Baseball players remember stuff from other baseball players for years. A lot of Hall of Famers have said that they've hit players after years after a certain incident happened. Now, if you extrapolate that, do you think the Dodgers are going to forget or they're going to be fine of what happened last night after they got pretty much cheated out of a championship? No. They're going to keep on coming out of Houston whenever they play, whether it's today, whether it's next year, whether whenever they get scheduled again, whether it's the postseason. This is not going to go away. And when you combine the fact, like, like you said, David, when Houston was being brash and doubling down on saying, yes, we earned this championship despite all the cheating allegations, which turned out to be true, that just makes the situation that much more hostile. And I don't see the Dodgers backing down at this at all. Whether or not Joe Kelly was – intentionally throwing or not I don't think he was because he didn't he didn't really throw a fastball at all he couldn't locate it that's not really the point I think that whether he was throwing or not we're still going to see some sort of retaliation from the Dodgers whether it's tonight whether it's the postseason whether it's next season this is not going to go away anytime soon and Rob Manfred and pretty much all of Major League Baseball can pat themselves on the back for this because their suspension that they put arguably wasn't enough. I thought that they really had to put their foot down to put cheating down for good, but because it was pretty much a slap on the wrist, all things considered, just a one-year suspension, I think that that really opens up other teams potentially cheating because the, the punishment just isn't that bad. So the Dodgers, this isn't over. This saga is not even close to over. Yeah, it doesn't even need to come from a fandom point that the Dodgers needed their – retribution it's just like i said last night it's the natural order playing itself out if you do if you do stupid things and just don't recognize it then you're going to earn stupid prizes and that's what the actors are doing and it's going to keep happening dodgers aren't going to be the only team wanting this type of retribution there are other teams out there that are like the yankees like the red sox that feel cheated out there and then there are going to be other teams that are just mad that there is a team that is shamelessly uh, owning a championship ring when they cheat, so it's it's not just going to be the Dodgers that ended up that end up hitting somebody or throwing at somebody on the Astros. They're just the first and the most uh, most apparent because they lost the World Series to Houston. If if we were not in, you know, facing your own division and then the West of the of the interleague division. The Astros and Yankees would be a firestorm of a series this season. I mean, it would be absolutely nuts. It just a roll this Chapman literally got, you know, jacked because he wanted to just destroy Jose Altuve. That would have been a dream series. I can now I can't wait for 2021. And I hope that if we want to see this kind of thing, I hope that the Yankees still hold on to that grudge a little bit when we get to 2021 so they can actually beat up on the Astros a little bit next next season. Baseball yes, players. For- baseball players. Oh, go don't to talk, talk. Baseball players don't forget. It might take years to get retribution. It might take months. It might just take weeks. It might take half a decade. Teams are going to get revenge. It's just a matter of when. Yes, and we will wrap up this entire series on Friday's show. Dodgers and Nationals play again tonight. 
at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Moving on to the NFL, Joey Bosa is now the highest paid defensive player in NFL history, $102 million guaranteed, $78 million guaranteed at signing, five-year extension. It's the first time the Chargers have ever given someone uh, $100 million or more. And you know the biggest loser of this? Well, actually, there's two, but the biggest loser from this are the 49ers because Nick Bosa is a lot better than his older brother and when he gets when it's his time to be paid he's gonna be asking for a boatload possibly in like the 150 160 range and who knows if the 49ers are gonna be willing to pay that but you know it also affects the guy that's been there forever keenan allen he's still waiting on the next deal so first start off with uh what does this do now for star defensive players especially a guy who's gonna get big money in a couple of years barring, you know, any serious injury in Nick Bosa. It's like, it's like every time a big def- defensive player, or even just a position player gets paid, it's going to drive up the market for those other top tier players in that, in that position. So expect, you know, some edge rushers and defensive ends to, to get, get, say, Hey, say, Hey, look, this guy got this much money and I think I'm way better than him. I want more. It's going to bring, it's going to drive the market. That's just how it works. So, and if Joey Bosa got that much, expect Nick to get paid big money when his time comes. And like you said, yeah, it does affect Keenan Allen, who's been with the Chargers forever at this point. But, I mean, if you're going to pick between two guys to pay, you're going to pick Joey. And Joey's the younger one. Joey is the more impact player at this point. And even though Keenan has showed loyalty and stayed with the team for that long, at this point, you got to figure out who can we build around. Joey Bosa is a, is a piece that you can build your defense around for years to come. As they build around him and build up that front, that front defensive line, that's going to be scary to, for opposing players that come into L.A. to face the Chargers. It's a, decent, it's a pretty good contract. It's you know, $135 million that keeps him on the team for the next five years, uh, $78 million guaranteed. So it's, it's definitely a huge chunk of money. But at that point, you have to realize, is this the guy worth paying? And, and in this situation, it's absolutely, you should definitely pay him. Well, like you said, David, the market is going to go up when players get this kind of money, especially front seven players. I mean, we've already seen front seven players get paid this caliber type of money over the past few years. And in fact, over the past couple of weeks, we saw that with Miles Garrett. We saw that with Chris Jones. We saw that with Khalil Mack a couple of seasons ago. So we're seeing players, obviously the quarterbacks are going to get paid. Wide receivers will get paid. Running backs will get paid to a degree. But front seven players, you know, those edge rushers, those are the marquee defensive players that a lot more teams are starting to lock up now very young, whether it's Bosa, whether it's Jones, and so on. And when you look at it from the Chargers' perspective, this is a pretty solid deal for them because even though if some people think it's an overpay, their salary cap situation over the next few seasons is actually pretty good, all considered, even if the salary cap goes down due to COVID concerns. So even though they locked up Bosa, I still think this gives them an avenue to lock up Allen as well. Of course, it all comes down to money and if Allen wants to stay with the team long term. But overall, you were seeing the Chargers starting to build a little bit of something here. They potentially got their franchise quarterback and Justin Herbert in the draft. And now they locked up their star guy on the defensive side. So we're starting to see a little bit more of a more succinct picture for the Chargers moving forward. And it starts with Bosa with this contract, which is the biggest in contract history for the Chargers. So we'll see how the deal works out. Yeah, and this probably, you know, is going to further my point in a column I wrote last year about wide receivers being expendable. They're, most of them are not going to get that, that high payday they, they, uh, they want. I mean, look at an Antonio Brown, who everybody thought was a generational talent. Uh, Pittsburgh loses him uh, last season, and they were still, while they were pretty bad to start because Ben Roethlisberger without, went out with injury, they were still, almost, they almost got that wild card spot and could have been a playoff contender, even without, you know, their generational talent and Antonio Brown. So when you look at position players that are going to get paid, it start, starts at the quarterback, then you look at defense, the, the defensive line, and then you look at your O-line, and then maybe, I would say even the running back is more valuable than the wide receiver, because there just aren't enough great, you know, elite running backs in the NFL right now. There's like four or five really great ones, but 
there's about 25, 30 wide receivers you can look and go, yeah, this guy can really improve our team. So when you look at a guy like DeAndre Hopkins or Keenan Allen, yes, they're great players. You can't take that away from them. But when you look at the entire dynamic of a team and who you're going to pay first, it, the wide receivers are not in the top half of that list. The NBA resumes tomorrow night. Clippers and Lakers, that's all I care about. What is it? I think it's the Jazz and Pelicans as well right before that. Clippers and Lakers, that's what everybody wants, although we will have no Lou Williams or the Clippers will have no Lou Williams or Montrez Harrell. Lakers might be without Anthony Davis. But from, we're going to talk about the TV viewers' expectations. What, what do we want out of it? And I'll just go right in and say what I want. Do not, under any circumstances, cut the mics on the court. If No fans. If I hear one mic being cut, if I hear mics being cut at all, we have a problem on our hands because we want to hear, you know what would take away the entertainment value of not having fans? Players talking mad trash to each other. That's, that's, that's what you want to hear. If you can't get that fan, that crowd noise, you have to let the natural sound of players talking, you know, just, you know, when it comes to plays and, you know, help defense. But also you want to hear that trash talk and you want to hear guys chirping back and forth. That's what makes, you know, a lot of sports fun is that we don't hear what's going on between players, you know, and it, the NBA has a real chance to provide that. And they're really in a special spot where they are enclosed and it's not like this big giant place like a baseball stadium where the sound just goes, you know, everywhere and it don't, it's not really enclosed. You have a chance to show, Hey, this is how players are during these games. You can see the, the uh, intensity really play out when there are no fans, when it's just the players and it's just them. So if, if the mics are cut, then uh, I'm, I'm, I might just end up tuning out because it's just not going to be fun having mics cut left and right. It's, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be any good. Hey man, at least there's basketball back, you know, like, I mean, they've been having scrimmages recently, but now we get actual. Come on, Cam. Gosh, you're such. I'm sorry. I I love the NBA, but uh, it is this is not uh, the NBA I grew up with. It's not the same. Although I love I love that there's more parity, but it's just still from the fun aspect. It's just the 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 playing aspect. It's just not as fun as it used to be. Cam, parody. we're in the middle of a pandemic. No, no, Nothing no. is going about, to be the same. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the game of basketball itself has been bad for the last couple of years. It has nothing to do with the pandemic. The game has just gone downhill for, since this since the Warriors dynasty came about. It's all about like, the three and not about you know you don't like guard centered offense. And, no, it's terrible. But so you'd rather have, you know, just big boys backing down people in the post and getting quick quick sky hooks? That's that's, easiest, that's what you're looking for? You get your easiest shot. It's not about the three. Get your easiest shot. No team wants to emphasize that, though. See, the NBA does something that the MLB does not. The NBA hypes up their actual action. They actually show the highlight plays, and that's what people need to see. And I'm super excited for basketball to be back. I just want to see competition. I'm a, I love, I, I'm really, I've been a fan of the NBA for, a, for a while now. You know, it's, it's been tough in recent years with the Phoenix Suns being, you know, probably the laughing stock of the NBA and it's, but it's just fun to see basketball come back and it's going to be interesting to see LeBron go for the chase for another ring because he's going to be in the mix. That Lakers team is don't even roll your eyes because you know it's true, Cam. The, the Lakers are definitely one of the favorites to come out of the West. And we'll pro I hope we see a, a Giannis and LeBron matchup in the finals when it gets to that point. You know, two MVP guys that have tried to go after each other. What do you keep? What do you keep? What is this, Cam? What? Tell, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry, but the Lakers are not the best team in the Western Conference. This is just, this is just the case. They have a losing record against another team in the Western Conference conference sir and it's about to be they're about to be one and three in this specific team to this specific team tomorrow night what the la clippers who are five yeah. and a half games back it's five and a half it doesn't matter at this point it's going to become down to actual series games games seven game series when it comes when it comes down to it so 
And do you take the Clippers in a seven game series against the Lakers if that does happen? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Well, absolutely. obviously you would because every time you know, just fandom takes over actual logic. Nope. No, nope. so bench just... depth, bench depth matters, and the Lakers okay. don't have that while the Clippers do. Okay, I'm I'm done. I'm hearing our superpower teams bickering over superpower teams. I'm sorry. The one thing I'm looking for that maybe COVID could help out with. You know, maybe some teams are a little rusty, and maybe that gives maybe the smaller tier teams an opportunity to maybe make some noise. All I'm hearing are the Bucks, the Clippers, the Lakers. What about the Thunder? What about the Raptors? What about the Celtics? What about any of them? We don't really hear about them because they really aren't the quote unquote super teams that the Golden State Warriors really monopolized and hyped up. I think if the NBA wants more parity, maybe COVID to a degree, might have been a saving grace because maybe that creates a little more parity in the game because all the players are starting to come back. Some players, similarly to MLB and NHL, might be opting out. Some players might not be healthy. So maybe some of those teams like the Thunder and so on and so forth, maybe they can make a little bit of noise. That's what I want as a viewer because I know the Lakers are going to be good. I know the Clippers are going to be good. I know the Bucks are going to be good. But what about the other 25-plus teams or however many teams are playing in the bubble? I don't really know about them. I want to I want to know about them. I want to see how good they are, and I think they could potentially be good, maybe because of the pandemic pausing the season for such a, a long period of time. That's what I want to see. Yeah, you actually brought up a good point because the format is going to be one something like we've never seen before because basically the top six teams in each in each conference are locked in for you know continued games in the bubble, and then those seven, eight teams are kind of the bubble teams right now at this point. It's still going to be eight teams in the, in the playoffs when it comes to it, but those teams that are not in those eight spots, then the teams that are kind of at the bottom, they still have a chance to finally to try, to try and get in there. You know, teams like the Suns, teams like the Spurs, who may have a shot to actually try and get in there. I mean, don't get me wrong. They have to – every st- single star has to fall in line for them perfectly in order for it to happen. But it still gives that opportunity. It still gives that chance. It gives us opportunities to see teams and see players that we may not necessarily see all the time actually shine and actually do something different. It puts a spotlight not just on LeBron, not just on Giannis, but puts a spotlight on a lot of guys that don't necessarily get the spotlight all the time. So that's so super interesting to see. If a person who's necessarily not interested in basketball that much watches and they really like a certain player that, say, is on you know the Kings, then – good for them. That's awesome because it actually shows that spotlight of that player who's really trying hard to help his team win and to show what he what he can. You got to take advantage of the spotlight when it's on you. Right. And we've all said how the NBA, like you said David, the NBA compared to MLB, the NBA actually markets their players. But potentially if the NBA wants to God forbid maybe overtake the NFL, if you really spotlight and highlight on these smaller tier players on the teams like the Kings, like maybe more so the 76ers, like the Magic. When you highlight players on those teams, that only creates better marketability for the entire sport, and that gets more players out there. And if if fans want to get into the NBA and they're tired of the super team mantra, then getting emphasis on those players to get fans into those teams only makes the sport that much more popular. So I think Adam Silver, he has a great thing going, but he could have an even more golden opportunity with this marketing and with this playoff format. Yeah, and I've been saying this all year. I think a team that could threaten the Lakers, the Clippers, is the Oklahoma City Thunder. Shy Gilgis Alexander, and I knew this ever since his rookie on the Clippers, where he just shined, is playing like an all-star this year. Chris Paul still, even at his even being a 10 plus year veteran in the league, still playing like the best two-way point guard in the NBA. Dennis Schroeder is a six man of the year contender and Steven Adams is going to do what Steven Adams does. And that's just be a freaking dog inside the paint. And he does that game after game after game. So they're really a true threat to potentially, you know, with more parity, not having to go to different home courts playing in one neutral area, it could really allow them to shine and allow them to potentially be uh, a team that could steal the Western Conference and possibly even get to the finals. And right, who thought about that with the Thunder? Remember, the trade for Westbrook happened around this time a year ago, and I thought, and I thought a lot of people thought, okay, looks like they're rebuilding. Maybe they switch when they uh, swap Paul for maybe more draft picks. But instead, they kept that core together. They kept Paul, and now look, they're actually pretty good. And actually, like you said, a dark horse Western Conference contender. So, I mean, 
given all the directions they could have went, arguably this is the, the direction that they that worked out the best for them. And that says a lot because they could have gone in a lot of other directions. So good for the Thunder. Let's we'll see what they can do. It's almost like the shortened season for MLB right now at this point because you can – if a team gets hot, they can change the entire different aspect of, you know, postseason and playoff contention. If a team gets hot really quick, really fast, they can completely change the aspect of what's going to happen when it comes to postseason. So it's super exciting. I love Adam Silver as a commissioner. He really shows that he actually puts his players first and actually really cares about the game and cares what the fans what, what the fans think about the game. So I think – I think they're really – if they keep in the bubble, if they keep, you know, holding players accountable, if they leave it, I think they have a great situation. And it's going to be great competition when it comes to, you know, real games coming tomorrow. Take notes, Rob Manfred. That's all. Shots fired because we don't like Rob Manfred here. All right, David. We have a new segment to combat our Fruit Loop Fridays. Instead of sort of negativity and calling out – stuff we like to address the good the good things in life the nice wholesome things and david is going to bring out his new segment called uh, wholesome wednesdays so david what do you got for us today now this wasn't necessarily to combat our fruit loops because you know me i love fruit loops but right now um i think it's just good to show a little good feel coming out of sports at this point everyone loves a feel good story and a lot of feel good stories come out of sports so we're starting the first edition of wholesome wednesday with Triple A, uh, Blue Jays Triple A affiliate manager for Buffalo, uh, Ken Huckabee. And Ken Huckabee and I have a little bit of history, actually. He used to be a former coach of mine. He helped me out with pitching a little bit when it came to Little League Baseball. I took some hitting clinics with him as well. One of the nicest, funniest guys you'll ever meet. He was absolutely incredible with me, and he was such a good guy. Uh, I, me and my mom went to uh, go went, want to win and watch him coach his son Kyle as well. His Kyle is also in the uh, Blue Jays organization. Uh, it's, it's just a great story. They're a great family. The Huckabees, we love you. Um, so we'll leave the link uh, to the article in the description. But so uh, Ken was, you know, trying to fill in a little bit with helping out the, the Blue Jays uh, inner squad matchups. And they didn't have an umpire. So who fills in for them? Ken Huckabee does. And the, the clips of his punch-out calls are absolutely perfect. He is sitting there with full catcher's gear and, you know, the full chest protector, the, the helmet, the, the knee pads and everything. It's, it's awesome to look at, and it just goes to show the, the kind of personality that Ken has that I, that I knew when I was younger. And it's absolutely a great story. The Huckabees, if you ever watch this, we love you. You guys are amazing. Ken, uh, awesome to see you again. Hope to see you soon back in Chandler. So it's just a feel-good story. It's good to see a guy that, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for and was crucial in helping my Little League baseball career was, is, is doing, doing awesome things at the professional level. So good to see you again, Ken. Hope to see you soon in, in, uh, in person uh, real soon. Yeah, and the Blue Jays are one of those dark horse teams that could potentially steal playoff spots. So a lot of a lot of cool things coming out of the Toronto camp this year, although they're not playing in Toronto. That will right. do it for this edition of the Rich Report. Thanks for watching. If you did on YouTube, make sure to just like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. If you are on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, make sure to uh, subscribe and leave a review as well. We will see you on Friday for our Fruit Loop Fridays. Going to preview the weekend ahead of us. And talk about anything that happens. I don't know. We're actually going to recap the Dodgers actual series and look at uh, the NBA restart. Look at the two games that resumed. So thanks for watching, and we will see you on Friday. Have a great rest of your day.